Olivia Lane is an English writer and essayist. In Crudo, a novella, she describes the frantic summer of 2017 in real time. Another book by her, The Lonely City, has been read and reread by many people during the corona lockdown. And now there's Funny Weather, Art in an Emergency, a collection of essays on art and artists, a very timely collection for these hectic times everywhere in the world. Hi, Olivia Ling. Thank you so much for joining us, us at the Henri Leboeuf venue at, at uh, Bozar in Brussels for our series of conversations under the title Repairing the Future. Thank you very much. Um, where are you at the moment and what have you been doing today? I am sitting in my house in Cambridge where I've been for the last three months, four months. Um, and I'm working on the edits of my new book, which is called Everybody. So I've spent the day writing about Freud, which has actually been quite pleasant. Writing about Freud and posting um, photographs of your garden on Instagram <laughs> is what I noticed. Yeah, well, that's kind of a daily thing. There's been a lot of um, respite and relief about being in the garden during this very strange period in human history. Mm -hmm. What is so uh, special about it? What what offer gives you respite? I think it's incredibly soothing to be outdoors, to be making something beautiful, to be in a space that feels healthy in a moment where health is so imperiled everywhere in in the world. It's such an unusual time to feel like each country is engaged with the same issue, which I can't remember happening in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. You compared it once um, to a much more pleasurable form of writing. What did you mean by that? I meant, actually what I meant is that there's no end in sight with the garden. It's a very interesting form of creativity because anything else you're making, as a working artist, you're always trying to get things to fruition, to a conclusion and with a book, you're working perhaps for three years, striving for some sort of perfect form. You never achieve it, but you're trying to get there. And the thing that's so nice about gardening is there is no perfection. There is no end point. You're always negotiating, planning, trying something else. And I think that, to me, feels extremely soothing when the rest of my life isn't like that at all. Mm -hmm. Also, it is uh, an activity both rooted literally in the past and and hoping or working towards a future, I imagine it's at this um, in-between point. Which is actually quite like writing itself. I think that's one of the things that's, that's the same, is that you're dredging through past material and you're trying to envisage something different. That sense of seeds is something, that sense of fertility is something that it feels like both writing and gardening potentially have. In um, The Lonely City, you write um, about loneliness and one of the sentences is loneliness um, as a longing for integration, for a sense of feeling whole. This is about feeling lonely in the city, but do you feel it's applicable to what we're going through right now? I think there are many things that are applicable about the kind of loneliness I was writing about. I was talking specifically about my experience in New York after a breakup, but also about many different artists of the 20th century experience of loneliness. And one of the things that was felt most central to me was that loneliness is something that's political, that people are stigmatized and that that causes immense loneliness. Of course, we're seeing that now. At the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, people like to say, and me included, this is something, we're all in the same boat, this is something that's affecting everybody. But of course it isn't. It affects the poor. It affects people who are already subject to prejudice. And that has been so um, clear in Europe, in England, in America, across the world, that there are groups that are experiencing it far more painfully. And if you are already isolated, then the forcible isolation of lockdown is so much worse than if you're embedded in a community or in a warm, loving family or relationship. So I think that sense of the political nature of isolation has become even more clear to me, even more vivid. Mm -hmm. And and what does that mean? Uh, it being a, a political, what what um, action does that require, or what answer, or how do we need to think about that? We need to change the world. I think <laughs> that's a good beginning. In short, 
I mean political in the sense of there is a virus and it affects people. It doesn't affect everybody equally. It affects people because of social conditions. It affects people because of political circumstance. It affects people because people of one race are treated differently from people of another race. And these are things that humans can change. We might not be able to invent a vaccine, but we can change those things. And I think we are seeing already drastic changes to those things. So I think for me as an artist, I, I'm not a scientist. That's that's not something that I can engage with. But in terms of the political reality of the world that I live in, then I think that is something that art can affect and that we can discuss, that we can think about the kind of world we want to be in. And this odd moment of pause that the world has entered, I think, is allowing us to do that, to think about that. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit more about what it is that art can contribute to this discussion or this idea of um, the political side to everything that's happening now? I think art is an enormously powerful force and I think sometimes we underestimate that. We think it's about empathy, we think it's about beauty, but I think it does much more than that. I think art is a terrific source of clarity. It's a way of thinking beyond the um, paranoid circularities of social media based news. So that sense that we're always just following headlines over and over again. Art can be a space where we can draw out consequences and connections where we can think more deeply then art can also be a force for resistance it can be a way of actually demanding political change fighting for visibility bearing witness to violence and inequality and finally the third thing is that I think art has this vast ability to envisage different futures. It's a place where you can think about dystopias, yes, but you can also think about utopias. You can also think about the kind of world that you'd want to inhabit and you can begin to move towards building that. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me mm -hmm. art has these multiple different forces. It shows that, uh, as Ali Smith um, says, you quote her in uh, Funny Weather, things aren't fixed. So there is possibility beyond the reality of today. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in a moment like this, where it feels like all of the certainties that we're so used to experiencing have been dismantled, upended, suddenly flight stops, suddenly a global economy starts to stutter and slow down. So this sense of, oh, you can't change the world, we've seen in the matter of weeks that you can change the world. The world can change. It can look utterly different almost overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, what about criticism that sometimes art literature only speaks to those who already know or have been taught how to read it, how to interpret it, how to understand it? Um, it's preaching to the choir, um, so to speak think that is utter rubbish. I just think that's such a terrible way of thinking about humanity. We are all alive to love and loss at every moment of our lives. We are so invested in reality and art is something that speaks to every person. You don't need to have an education to understand it. You, that might enhance or enrich understandings but it's so patronizing to think that it's a sport for the elite. It absolutely isn't. It's for all of us. Um, you uh, were in your 20s uh, an environmental activist. Um, did you at the time really believe you could change the world by doing what you did, among others, withdrawing from the world um, for a couple of months, living on your own in a very low impact way? Well, that's two different things. Um, as an environmental activist, I was living in trees, in tree houses, in the um, path of road building projects. So, yeah, we changed the world. We stopped those road building projects. We created some small resistance to omnipresent environmental despoilation. Yeah, I think direct action can be very powerful. And perhaps we'll touch on more of what's happening with direct action right now in a minute. But um, the, the sequel to that was... And I think this is true of, of lots of activists, a period of intense burnout where I went and lived on my own um, in a little sort of dwelling that I built myself in a field and lived an almost sort of animal life for a few months. And I think really that was to do with grief. That was to do with the sense of, you know, we managed to change something. We managed 
with our activism, with our physical presence to stop one thing happening. But the sense of climate change, the oncoming catastrophe of climate change in the 90s felt terrifying. And that's, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a long time ago. It is obviously so much more prevalent, more frightening now. Um, So I think that period was really a sense of hopelessness that I went through almost like a spell and came out the other side thinking, no, I do. I do believe that we can change things. I'm not certain that we will, but I believe we can. How do you balance that now? Or are they two, uh, two but the same things? Namely, um, being active in the world almost as an activist on the one hand and writing, having to withdraw to do that on the other hand. I wouldn't describe myself as an activist separate from being an artist. I think it seemed to me that um, art was art was the right thing for me. It was it was writing was the way that I could best be of use, best make sense of the world, best convey the the sort of things that I felt were wrong and things that I dreamed could be better to to talk about reality as as we inhabit it and as it potentially could be. Um, And that is that always requires a kind of back and forth into a worldly life and into a very secluded life that you have to do that if you're making anything, if you're a painter, if you're a composer. Um, And it's always felt in some ways quite natural to me. I'm I'm happy to draw back. I have to say I'm quite pleased that there aren't 2000 people in this room that we're sitting in, (laughs) in that we're not quite sitting in. (laughs) Well, they're here, so to speak, or <laughs> mentally at least, uh, and, and soulfully. <laughs> in your own homes. <laughs> exactly. Um, in With regard to, to the um, potential of art, uh, the, the power of art, um, you refer to Eve Kozowski Sedgwick and her idea of reparative art. Explain us a little bit um, what it means and, and how it applies to what you're trying to do or doing. So Eve Kowalski Sedgwick was um, a writer in the 80s and 90s, an academic and really one of the creators of queer theory. And she wrote this very fascinating, quite enigmatic essay um, during the AIDS crisis that was about two different modes of reading. One of them is called the paranoid mode and one is called the reparative mode. And she spends a great deal of this essay setting out the paranoid mode, which, you know, I think we're all very familiar with. You go on Twitter, that's the paranoid mode. It's about conspiracy. It's about uncovering hidden violence. It's about very important things. But we have a tendency to believe that's the only way we can deal with knowledge. It's very seductive. And one of the problems is that it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. It feels productive while you're doing it. But the revelation of hidden violence doesn't necessarily stop violence. So at the very end of this quite long essay, Sedgwick starts thinking, Is there something else? Is there another way of approaching reality, information, knowledge? And she starts to talk about the reparative reading, which is a way of seeking sustenance from a culture that might not desire to sustain you. It's about finding liveliness, excitement, joy in a world that can still be violent, paranoid and inimical. Um, and she draws out various artists that she think she thinks are driven by this reparative motive and it seemed to me as I was putting together this collection of essays Funny Weather that a lot of the artists I've been drawn to over the past decade have been artists with reparative motives they have been artists who've been trying to create something new buoyant full of hope from a world that they knew thoroughly well was violent, dangerous, and full of despair. Mm -hmm. And one of the people you introduced the reader to is Derek Jarman, um, who you were introduced to um, by your sister, as I understand. Um, Tell us uh, about what makes him so special for you, apart from the fact, or maybe also the fact, of course, that he tended to a beautiful, special garden. Well, I think that garden is very important. So 
Derek Charman was a gay British filmmaker, but also an artist, a set designer, a writer, this sort of extraordinary polymath, really. Um, England's last alchemist, they call him sometimes. Um, and when he was diagnosed with AIDS in the 80s at that point, it was an almost certain death sentence. There wasn't any treatment that would prolong life. And it was very frightening. It was a very frightening moment in history. And Jarman, for a start, was one of the first people to make his diagnosis public. So he was one of the first public figures in Britain who people knew was HIV positive. Um, he carried on being an activist. He carried on being a thorn in the side of the establishment. He carried on writing and campaigning. But at the same time, he chose at that moment to start building this garden at Prospect Cottage in Dungeness on the coast of England that was really, I think, an icon of reparative art. It's this beautiful, unlikely, compelling place built literally into the shingle right next to, of all things, a nuclear power station. So it looks utterly bleak. It seems like the most unpromising place on earth. It's pummeled by winds. It's salty. It's a very difficult gardening environment. But he made this place that is full of sculptures, not like any other garden that existed before. It's He grew native herbs. He grew all kinds of strange plants. It feels rich, fertile, abundant, and most importantly of all, it doesn't have any walls, it doesn't have fences, it doesn't have hedges, it's completely open. So he made this space that was almost like a testament to another kind of possibility. It was a utopia in itself. And he did that really in the teeth of death. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, like Cedric and, and now Jarman, um, other artists as well that you write about. Um, sorry, were or are gay. You, your, your mother um, was or is gay, um, if I read correctly. How did that impact your view of being seen as different, being um, considered out of the ordinary and the importance as well of, of, of gender, of sexuality? I think it, it's quite foundational. I mean, it can't not be to, to grow up in a gay family at a very homophobic era in British history. It was the era of Section 28. So there was a law that said that you couldn't treat, teach in schools the, um, the gay family as a pretended family relationship. So the, the family that I existed in was, was outlawed by the state from the beginning. Um, and I think that that immediately is gives you a sense of um, suspiciousness about the state, to, a sense that um, you need to find or furnish your own kind of alternate world. That, that fit, felt from the beginning like an important imperative. Then, you know, my own sense of gender is certainly fluid so I never felt like I fitted into heteronormative world society I didn't grow up in it and then I didn't want to belong in it myself so the the queer world and especially that sort of very um punky antagonistic queer world that I've written about so much has always felt like a safe haven to me and I think that meant that coming across Sedgwick's essay it felt instinctively right it felt like something that I had seen and felt in my own life as well as an academic mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that is always important to me in my work is there isn't a separation between lived life and the academic or the sort of aesthetic world. Those things feel to me like they interpenetrate all the time. And what I'm trying to do with my work is draw out those resonances to show the ways in which art is political, to show the ways in which ideas are embodied, to, to keep going back and forth between the realm of, of the body of the real and the realm of ideas of the mind. Yeah, that, that concept of ideas being embodied, is that what also drove you to write um, this book you're working on now? You, you mentioned in the beginning that you were writing about Freud, um, a book about bodies, um, if I'm well informed, bodies as the ultimate barrier between people. Would you agree with that or, or is that something else? Bodies, it's really about why bodies are so hard to inhabit, why so many bodily markers like gender, like race, 
serve as a, a source of oppression throughout life, all the ways in which that happens, all the ways in which the body is subject to violence, to sexual violence, to illness, and at the same time, the way in which the body remains a force of power, a force of solidarity, and a force of change in the world. So in some ways, this book is a history of the great freedom movements of the 20th century, the civil rights movement, gay liberation, feminism, but also musing on why those movements might be running into difficulties now, why some of the successes that we thought were permanent might be being rolled back. And at the same time, how those struggles continue. And we are seeing this with Black Lives Matter right now. Those struggles continue. Yes, it's actually very much of, of the moment and with a long history, as you say. And how do you feel after having read so much about it, studied the subject? Um, are, you, are you optimistic about where this might take us or, or not? I am optimistic. I am optimistic to watch the statue of a slaver rolled into the water in Bristol. Incredible to see that the police are being defunded in various places in America to, to go from this sort of almost outlying cry of defund the police to seeing that become a reality in a matter of days is the most extraordinary thing that I've seen in a very long time. And that fills me with optimism, the sense that people coming together in the streets can change the world is something that I believe so strongly. I was at my first gay pride at the age of eight or nine. So it, it's something that I feel very deeply. I believe very deeply and I'm thrilled to see that. And I think after spending the last few years reading about the history of the civil rights movement and the terrible losses that happened in the 60s, the ways in which those hopes were destroyed, crushed by white supremacy and by ignorance and by laziness on the part of a white establishment. I think seeing that potentially beginning to change is the most incredible thing. Yeah, you say potentially beginning to change. What do you think might actually make it happen this time compared to before? What, what changed or what might occasion a tipping point now? Well, I think we're seeing change. I think we're seeing change in America right now. I think the, the idea that people are starting to think differently about the police and potentially that sense of abolition of police and potentially the incarceration state will be a vast, vast change. And any rollback of that is already a victory. Mm -hmm. But there is a paradox, uh, isn't there, between people uh, wanting to feel free especially now we've experienced um, how limiting a lockdown can be in so many, so many ways. Wanting to be free on the one hand and on the other hand, having this strong, strong sense of belonging and even needing a group to belong to um, and, and defining the other as another, belonging to another group. Where does this come from or how do you look at that, that contradiction in, in all of us, I think, if we're honest? I think that is the, the great question about human existence, right? Okay, you've got half an hour. <laughs> I have thought an awful lot about it. I don't think that that's something that is easy to sum up. Why do people choose to hate? I mean, this is Freud's great question. What What is it about people that makes them decide to form into small bodies and hate and destroy other groups of bodies? It, It feels in some ways mysterious, but I think that's a who knows. At the same time, we do know that the system of white supremacy is having appalling effects on the entire world. And we do know how to dismantle it. We do know how to do that. So I don't know that we need to sort of sit there musing over the question of why. I think it's more about getting on and doing it. Yeah, that's a rational approach. The analysis is made, now fix it. But the, the, isn't part of the problem that strong feelings are also in the mix in this case? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but I don't, I'm not sure that that's the most profitable thing to be thinking about right now. I mean, it's something I've been thinking about and it's something I'll no doubt talk about much more when everybody is published. But in this particular moment, I don't think saying, oh, human nature is violent and divisive 
so there's no point in changing is is the tack to take. I think let's try and pursue these changes. Let's see what happens. We live inside systems. Humans live inside systems, and those systems shape the things that they can think, the things that they can do, and the ways that they relate to each other. If you change those systems, different things are possible. So in some ways, I think making the changes is more important than having these very settled ideas about what human nature is or isn't that actually are historical and political in them in themselves. Mm -hmm. And people can change if you change systems, is what you're saying. Um, earlier, yeah. you spoke of, of possibilities, um, um, the, the possibility of other realities that um, fiction offers or the, the gateway to these other um, realities that fiction offers. Um, you mentioned John Berger in that respect mm -hmm. and his idea of hospitality. Is, can you tell us a bit about how that ties in with, with um, the importance of fiction for you and, and in your life? Yeah, that, that John Berger thing about hospitality is very beautiful. I saw him talk towards towards the end of his life and um, a person in the audience was asking him about the refugee crisis. This this was perhaps five or six years ago, really at the height of that moment of anxiety about refugees and the sense that walls were beginning to be put up across Europe and across America. Um, and he answered the question by saying, I have been thinking about the storyteller's duty to be hospitable. And everybody felt slightly uneasy and thought, "This did he hear the question? Does he know what the question was? And he carried on talking and it became clear that what he was saying was that fiction, art itself, is a space in which we encounter the stranger, a space in which we can welcome what's different. And perhaps this attaches to the question that you were just asking that maybe this is one of the functions of art is that you can encounter something different from you and you can learn that it isn't a threat. You can learn that you can be more open to difference. You can absorb some of that difference. And that sense of needing to be at war with the unknown can perhaps melt away, can perhaps transform into something else. And Berger lived a long life believing in that very passionately, traveling across the world encountering many different kinds of people and the fact that he kept that faith so strongly to the very end of his life get that gives me hope in itself i think mm -hmm. someone very strong in that conviction and and living by it as well by the way it also mm -hmm. brings many different kinds of people and the uh, that those encounters did enlarge him those encounters did have that effect going out open-handed into the world didn't show him, oh, the world is a hateful, violent place. It, 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 he saw that, he was aware of that, but at the same time, his approach, I think, was very enriching for him and for everyone that he came into contact with. Do you think that will change the way we meet, um, traveling less perhaps or not, and, and talking to each mm -hmm. other via screens like we do now? Do you think this is a true uh, meeting or conversation, or is it different from what we were used to face to face, looking each other really in the eye and not through cameras and then another screen? It, yes, I've been thinking about this a lot as well because so, so much of my work has been about contact, the importance of contact, the body, people meeting each other, sex, protest. Now we're in this world where bodies are sequestered, they're trapped in their homes and it, it's made me, as I, I'm sure it's made very many people really question what what contact means, what intimacy means, and what engagement means. What what kind of engagement are we having here? What kind of engagement is possible for us? I think, again, this comes back to the realm of art is a place where intense contact happens between people who aren't there. You make an object, you send it into the world, and it in, is engaged with by people long after you're dead. So that that model of a way of contacting and a way of communicating without the human body is already there. There is that possibility. But is it enough? Time, I am not certain yet whether it is enough. It's one possibility, but there's no question that this is a loss. There's no question that talking like this is very different. And I'm very um, 
sceptical about the promise of computers, of social media interaction, of dealing with people in this disembodied way. I think there are many potentials for misunderstanding, isolation, surveillance. It seems um, sort of breathtakingly promising to be able to talk to people across the world in an instant in my own sitting room. And at the same time, it isn't the same as sitting down with with other humans. And the, to come to the very first thing that you asked, what is this going to lead to if people can't travel, if people can't engage? It feels like it we were already moving in that direction. Brexit, America's build a wall, the whole sort of sense of giving up on the promises of multiculturalism and a free movement that have happened over the last few years have culminated in some way in this strange moment where everybody is now pulled back, right, retreated right back into their homes. We have to resist that. We have to find a way of resisting that. We have to find a way of continuing to communicate with everyone, with everybody. And I think we're going to have to be very innovative about how we find those those new ways. And I'm not sure it's just talking on Skype or Zoom. No. Uh, were you surprised by, by how um, important touch is? Uh, I don't know if you're a hugger, for example, or whether you um, usually um, give a kiss to friends you meet in the street or something like that. But um, do you, are you thinking about... Uh, yeah, touch and the importance of that in, in connecting with people? I think uh, I'm kind of an uptight British person, so I'm quite glad about <laughs> two kisses, three kisses. But at the same time, it, it's, not, it's not just hugging it. It's the fact of how you are when you're in a room with somebody that you are picking up all the time so many different cues from another person's body, from the presence of another person's body. You can feel that they're sad. You can feel that they're excited. All of that falls away when you're talking like this. It, we're not as creatures designed to communicate by way of such a sort of paucity of information. It's basically visual and auditory. And I think that makes it much harder to build trust, go deep in a conversation. And yet, I really want to sort of underscore how grateful I am that we do have these routes of communication. I mean, I would have been really lost without them. I know that they've meant so much to so many people. And the ability with something like Instagram to just feel that you can still check in with a lot of my friends are in New York. It's been a very difficult place recently. And to just sort of know how they are on a daily basis has been a huge relief. Mm -hmm. Is it? Am I correct that you are thinking of uh, writing um, about utopias next? <laughs> yes. Wow. How did you know that? <laughs> okay. Um, so... Paint us a picture, um, if you please, of what that might be. Um, or no, let me start with something else. Sorry, I'm going to correct myself. Is a utopia um, always a good thing? Well, that's kind of the question of the book, actually. That, that is <laughs> what I was thinking about. Um, I, was, I was interested, I have been interested over the last couple of years by how much of our entertainment is dystopias, how, you know, things like The Handmaid's Tale, things like The Road, how addicted we seem to be to watching these um, worlds where the worst possible thing is happening. And it seems now so close to day-to-day -to -day reality that I felt like, why are we putting our creative energy into this? Why are we imagining these things? We could be imagining other things. So I started thinking about utopias, the utopias I've loved, the utopias that I'm interested by, and particularly thinking about the garden as utopia, this sense of paradise, this sense of Eden that we we have so strongly culturally. Um, and where that comes from, where those ideas are drawn from, and what sort of, um, what they might conceal, I think, that... One of the things that I'm very interested in is how this sort of sense of a beautiful English landscape is actually completely embedded in colonialism, slavery, um, the enclosures, the taking away of the land of the poor in, in this country. So the sense that um, 
I think beauty can be very sinister. Beauty can conceal a lot. And that's something that I want to try and tease out. What what would it mean to have a common paradise rather than a paradise that's exclusive? What would it mean to have a utopia that everyone can share? Is that something that's possible? Or is the idea of paradise by its nature something that involves some people being cast out and behind a wall? Derek Jarman's idea of a garden without walls is really central to the thinking around this. And what you said in the beginning, what are the utopias that inspired you or at one point um, fascinated you? Can you give an example? One of the ones that I've been thinking about a lot is um, Ursula Le Guin, who is an American science fiction writer who invented also I mean, science fiction is such a rich trope of utopia anyway. I'm not a big reader of science fiction, but when I do, I feel like, wow, these people are thinking with much more imagination than the rest of us. Um, but she wrote all kinds of different utopias. And there was one in particular called Far From Home that was about um, a world in California post a kind of apocalyptic climate change scenario that might be our own world um, that thought about a sort of much more low impact civilization. And that sort of thing can be incredibly worthy and incredibly dull. And Ursula Le Guin's wasn't like that at all. In a way, it was quite like the Pasolini films that I was describing. It felt very earthy and exciting. And that really made me think, we're not dreaming these dreams. And maybe we should be. Maybe we should really be putting our energy into thinking about the kind of worlds that we want to inhabit, because they're not going to come from nowhere. They're not going to come if people aren't planting those seeds, laying those foundations, really thinking about the possibilities for human life. But there was this brief window. I don't know what it feels like right now in the UK, of course. Um, there was this brief um, interval during the lockdown, I think, that in various countries people felt like, okay, like you mentioned earlier in the conversation, things can change. We can stop flying all of a sudden. So things we, we didn't dare dream of a couple of months ago all of a sudden are a new reality. But that window seems to be closing. Um, so the question really is, do you believe that we will take a new way of life in some respects or in all respects um, from this experience with Corona and lockdown? Or do you think it will quite quickly be business as usual again? I suspect that in a lot of ways it will be business as usual, but I also think something of a sort of um, smoke and mirrors has been taken away, that we that has been something that's been said to climate change protesters for as long as I've been involved and probably far longer. Oh, this is unstoppable. You can't stop this. Well, we've seen that you can stop it. And if you can stop it once, you can stop it again. At the same time, I think late capitalism is one of the most powerful forces on earth, the most inventive, innovative astonishingly resilient forces, sorry to say. Um, and I have a great deal of certainty that the second all of this started, those forces were already working out how to recoup losses, how to continue, how to lobby. And I think it's it's a fight ahead. Of course it is. It wasn't just going to sort of dissolve in a moment. That, that would be absurd. And I don't think anyone was that naive. I think it's more that it was astonishing to see that something that we were told was so unstoppable could be stopped and could be stopped very fast. I think that that should be a source of hope, but I don't think that that's something that they're not going to stop of their own accord. Mm -hmm. Is there something in your life that you've decided I will do this differently from now on, whatever small or big thing it is? That's a good question. I don't know. In, in so many ways, the day to day texture of my life hasn't changed. I mean, I can imagine for many people, the world of work is going to change significantly. That I think a lot of people won't want to commute. A lot of companies are going to realize that they don't need to be sending people across the world. And um, I felt uneasy about flying for quite a long time and been pulling back from taking those sort of international trips that writers are often offered. Um, and that's something that I that probably will stay with me. I think more, it's actually something that I think I want to continue to resist, which is, I don't know how shared this is an, as an experience, but a feeling of 
this idea of contagion, this idea that there's an invisible virus and that you need to be scared of other people and you need to keep a distance from other people, obviously that's a public health strategy that we need to follow. But at the same time, I think it can um, very rapidly play into sort of paranoia and suspicion of other people, a desire to sort of shrink away from other people. And I think that's something that I really want to resist in myself, that keeping separate the idea of there is a safe distance and other people are dangerous. I think those two things can slide into each other and it's very important to not allow them to. Yeah, we were already um, risking to be trapped in echo chambers and then there was this social yeah. distancing on top of that and the walls yeah. you refer to and so on. So if we don't yeah. resist that, um, the world is going to be a dystopia rather than a utopia in a, in a short while. Um, and how do you um, fight another possible burnout, referring back to um, your environmental activist uh, years as a, as a twin. Do, do you feel you're better equipped now? You can, you can uh, live with the fact that it's a long haul battle and, and it needs resilience and regenerating constantly? I think writing for me in some ways is sustaining that At the moment that I started writing everybody, it was just after Trump had got in. I was feeling intense despair, horror. I mean, Brexit as well was a very um, agonizing moment, really, that that was so painful. That's the closest to despair I've, I've come in a long time. And deciding to write a book about these sort of larger questions of bodies, violence, hatred, resistance, um, and then sort of drilling into those stories, really trying to think about their legacy in the 20th century, their legacy in things like the Holocaust, their legacy in things like the Second World War, their legacy in the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy in America's slavery. Actually engaging with it feels to me much better than this sort of sense of hopelessness and dread, actually trying to make sense of the connections between things, to see possibilities that might not have been fully taken and to try and get a sense of clarity and then to give that out into the world for other people to read. That It feels to me like I'm working and it feels useful. And I think that's that's the closest I come to hope, really. That mm -hmm. that does create its own energy. And, and what does it, that... Um, how does that make you feel about human beings? Are we more competitive uh, beings or more um, constructive and cooperating beings in your mind in general? I think we're absolutely oscillators between the two. It, it seems to me that those are the poles of humanity. We We move back and forth between them. And as I said earlier, I think we can create systems that heighten the best of us and check the worst of us in each of us. And this, this again, is something that Freud, towards the end of his life, was so concerned with exactly that question that you just asked. This is what he's writing about in Civilization, It's Discontents. What do we do with humans? What do we do with these violent people, these irrational people who, at the same time, are capable of such tenderness, such ingenuity, such love? And he believed so strongly that civilization was something that could bring out the best in people and suppress and subdue the worst. And it seems to me we haven't found the right form of civilization yet, but I'm hopeful that we can at least improve on what we have so far. So they're not visibly here, but lots of people are watching and listening to what we're discussing here. Um, you have the floor. Um, is there anything you want to say to um, people, maybe especially young people right now, um, for the future or something you want to pass on that we haven't discussed yet? Or maybe summarize what the main thing is, according to you, for this moment in time with regard to the future? I think hope feels to me like the most powerful force Through everything I've lived, I think hope is is such an intensely powerful force. Um, I think this is a moment of immense possibilities in terms of challenging racism, in terms of the environment. I think um, 
we're at a kind of brink in in human existence and without wanting to sort of make it about sides I think you can choose to be on the side of liberation you can choose that anyone can choose that be on that side Olivia Ling, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your ideas and um, thoughts and names and works of artists that inspire you. Thank you very, very much for helping us repair the future. Thank you so much.